one of the big thing on markets, of course, is money and stable coins is our money connected to the mainstream market in the crypto market. And they've been in the news, whether it's Terra Luna's uh, UST that we talked about a long time ago, yep. in fact, mentioned before it collapsed. Uh, but, you know, there are not all stable coins are the same. And there are other stable coins that were born before Terra Luna UST, and they are still thriving and surviving. Some are centralized, yes. some are decentralized. There are many different kinds of digital assets pegged to a dollar or a currency, a fiat currency of some kind. And that's really what this article is about. It's it's stating that in the future, as more regulation takes place on an international or I guess in this case, especially international global standards, mm -hmm. uh, but it gets enforced and implemented in nations that a lot of the access to stable coins that exist in the market right now, they may go away in a year or two yeah. from now, whether it's MIM or DAI or FRAX or go list the whatever stable coin is out there. If it's not the USDC circle approved or maybe a different even, type of. And it's not even clear if that, you know, would meet the, uh, the standards they're talking about here. You're but right. yeah. So this is the, so the FSB financial stability board, this is a entity that was created after or at, at the end of a G20 meeting. And it has, it doesn't have any legal lawmaking ability, but it does, it, it is taken serious as a rec as a recommendation, international body that issues recommendations and, um, and has a lot of influence on national governments because of its G20 connections. So the, the, uh, the takeaway here is that if if the if they're when their recommendations are made later on i think later this month if those become law that the thinking is is that most stable coins or if or many or if, or if not all would would not be legal and there's and so the question is what are the, what kind of regulations are they going to recommend and or what could they do to to meet them potentially and i think one of the things people are talking about is not having the uh, the backing, the stablecoin collateral backing be made of private debt, but more and private debt would be like a company, a bond of a company, right? Um, you know, private bond, um, short term bonds, things like that. They, they're they looking more for public debt so that you're in. According to the article, there has been an effort to on the part of of, uh, of stable coins to to get out of private debt, to make their reserves more transparent in terms of public debt. And so that's one thing to think about. But uh, beyond that, these these stable coins would also have to apply and um, be approved essentially as a security. Uh, as a, and and these in, these companies that issue these would have to be security issuers essentially. So that's really so it's not so much that the um, the standards are unclear as it is as the, as it is that hey you know you you would have to get licensed. And and who's to say that any of these licenses would be given out, right? So you could, the thinking is is that this kind of opens the door to CBDC as the only right. stablecoin um, that's going to have a, a future. Uh, uh, some of it, hopefully, um, I mean, some of it just seems blown out of proportion. The idea of of requiring certain kinds of redemption rights. I mean, the reality is that fiat currency itself is not redeemable anymore in any type of silver or gold or commodity. The right. idea that something has to be backed one for one by anything in the world of blockchain and crypto that's born from a financial system that is that does not have that type of collateral backing. It's, it just seems right. um, disingenuous. I mean, how do you expect that to work? The reality is, is that many of the stable coins that exist in blockchain and crypto are are in some ways more redeemable or more backed than many fiat currencies in that they have collateral reserves of Bitcoin or Ethereum or digital assets that are used in order to keep um, the peg as well, yeah. or even having cash dollar denominated assets that are actually held in, in reserve too. So, you know, um, 
when governments print trillions of dollars and, and issue new currency, there isn't this same type of requirement, you know, in order to. Um, well, their collateral in those moments would just be a bond, right? So it's yeah, I, I hear you. It's it's interesting how and, that and and the idea um, to determine how how DeFi should be regulated. You know, it would be nice, and this is where you'll see U.S. or China or different countries. But how, which countries promote research and development with regulation, and which countries kind of stifle it? Because you yeah. look at DeFi, and in a lot of these areas of of AMMs or bridges and interoperability, and some of these amazing tools, the market is allowing to be built on these different networks, and so. Uh, allowing a space for these for for this mm -hmm. growth to take place this to mature in blockchain i think is something that could just like you have kusama for polka dot you have these test networks yeah in many in many ways allowing DeFi, ethereum polygon layer twos to to grow and exchange in the web3 world that is a great testing ground for products or things that could be used on you yeah. know in, in later on na yeah national so in a more um, regulated way we'll stay up to date on what regulations the imf international monetary fund i mean you know you don't want it to be like the fox in charge of the hen house here but when you're when you're talking about the most centralized most powerful monetary institutions in the world um deciding on how a new technology sh should be used when many parts of that new technology directly compete or make obsolete some of the intermediaries and functions of the traditional system. I mean, if you look at International Monetary Fund, Bank of International Settlements, private Federal Reserve banks in different countries, and the, these methods of transferring wealth, transferring value, creating money, it would definitely be streamlined, you know, when you use blockchain technology, you wouldn't need as many accountants in the building late at night, keeping electricity on to make sure that the books are balanced. A, a lot of these processes are to be automated, no matter how the technology is adopted. If you like this information and you would like to learn about what's going on in the economy, the macro outlook and how it applies to blockchain and the opportunities, you like this channel? hit the subscribe button, notification, hit the like button that helps this knowledge get out. And of course, we will leave links below. You can support the channel below. And of course, if you like one-on-one -on -one help, then you're saying, God, I, I would like to learn more about proof of work, proof of stake, layer ones, layer twos, what's what airdrops, IBC interoperability. How does this stuff work? A web 3.0 wallet, storage, security. That's right. We can help you out. Just fill out this information, your name, your email, what you'd like to learn about, and drop us a little message, and we'll be happy to get back to you and set up a time for some one-on-one -on -one consulting or some group tutorial sessions if you are with a firm or an institution that is looking to catch your people up to speed. That's what we do, catch you up to speed. And I think that uh, we've caught you up to speed on what's going on in the world today, right now. Have a beautiful day. Namaste. Until the next time. Thank you.